All right, so let's get started. So uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, linear programs. Uh, but before we do that, we're going to uh, go through a little bit of review. So uh, let's see. All right, so last time we talked about uh, Newton's method with equality constraints. So we had been Newton, doing Newton's method for a while uh, before that. Uh, and the equality constraints, uh, basically what you wanted to do was to uh, look for um, the uh, tangent to the constraint and the tangent to a level set of, uh, of our function, right? So here's a level set of our function. And uh, here's our constraint. And you want them to uh, share a tangent, which is this line here, right? Uh, and so uh, you can set that up. It's not actually much more difficult than the ordinary Newton's method. And so, uh, uh, so that, works out, that works out pretty well. We gave a couple of examples, uh, bundle adjustments and inference in uh, exponential families, maximum likelihood inference in exponential families. We talked about the convergence of Newton's method. So uh, typically there is two phases, the um, damped phase in which we're taking a step size less than one uh, and we're reducing the function by a constant amount per step. Uh, and then the quadratically convergent phase where we're taking step size of one uh, and uh, essentially doubling the number of significant digits in our solution at every, uh, at every time step. Um, we compared, uh, we had our our uh, table of uh, different evaluation metrics for all of the different algorithms. So uh, we, we compared Newton, FISTA, uh, and stochastic and deterministic gradient and subgradient. And uh, they're basically the take home message is that they're good for different things. They're all good things to have in the toolbox, but some problems, uh, one method may be much better than, uh, than others. And we talked about variations of Newton's method, like uh, uh, quasi-Newton algorithms like LBFGS, uh, Gauss-Newton, which is for solving least squares problems, uh, and levenberg markart which is an example of a trust region method. One more variation that we didn't have time to get to that I just want to mention briefly is Fisher scoring. So if you remember, uh, Newton, Newton's method in uh, an exponential family had this form, where um, uh, this was the variance of our uh, statistics given theta uh, was the Hessian, right? Uh, and then this whole thing, the difference between the empirical and the, um, uh, and the um, mean that's predicted given theta, uh, this was the negative gradient, right? And uh, so that was a nice thing for exponential families, but for other distributions that aren't in an exponential family but still have a parameter vector theta, you can still use this formula uh, in place of Newton's algorithm. Uh, and since, uh, since the variance has to be positive semi-definite, this is a descent direction, even if you don't have uh, any regularization, which is nice. Uh, and the Hessian is also independent of the data, which may or may not make it easier to calculate. Uh, there are lots of tricks for calculating variances, and so uh, often, often it winds up that uh, this uh, Hessian in quotes is easier to calculate than the true Hessian. Uh, there's sort of folk wisdom that this might have a wider radius of convergence than the true Newton method. Uh, I don't know of a proof of that, but I've tried it in some experiments, and that seems to be true. Uh, and this can be super linearly convergent, meaning that, uh, meaning that it's still a very fast method for... Uh, for optimizing. Right. So, uh, all right, um, let's uh, let's get through uh, the administrivia for today. So, uh, homework two is due now. Um, if you haven't handed it in, now would be a good time to uh, to get up and hand it in. We'll take a short break for people to hand in, and we'll collect it after the after the break. Or has everybody actually handed it in? All right, then. We can just, uh, just go ahead and collect it. That's great. All right. Uh, homework three is hopefully going to go out tonight. We, uh, we're still working on some final tweaks. Uh, and I wanted to give you an update on the final project. So um, we uh, put the requirements for the project milestone report up on the website. You can take a look at them. Uh, I went over them in class a few times ago. Uh, if 
Uh, if anybody has any questions, you know, feel free to contact us. Um, the final poster session uh, is going to be 3.30 to 6.30. Uh, on 1212, which is a Wednesday in the Newell Simon Atrium. Uh, it's going to be open at uh, it's going to be open at 3 p.m. for you to set up your uh, posters. Uh, and then finally, uh, you should all have gotten emails from your TA mentors um, uh, to set up meetings uh, regarding your projects. So uh, please set those meetings up. All right. uh, any questions? All right. So, linear programs. Uh, so a linear program, so far we've been doing uh, unconstrained optimization. And now, uh, now we're going to switch to um, equality and inequality constraints. So uh, linear programs are sort of the quintessential example of constrained optimization. Uh, so you have a vector of uh, n variables, which I'll call x1 through xn. Uh, and uh, each one of these variables uh, can have a lower and an upper bound. Uh, the lower bound could be minus infinity, and the upper bound could be plus infinity. So they don't have to have lower and upper bounds. Um, uh, and then you have an objective, which is uh, to uh, minimize or maximize. Uh, it'll be fixed for each individual program, but you can have minimizing LPs and maximizing LPs. Uh, a linear function of the variables. So I'll write that as uh, the sum from i equals 1 to n of ci times xi, right, uh, which is equal to the dot product between some vector c and the vector of variables x. Okay? Uh, and then you can have the constraints. And the constraints can be inequality or equality constraints. Um, I'll write down uh, an equality constraint just to uh, just for example. So uh, the sum over i equals one to n of a i j times uh, x i is equal to b j, right? And so we have uh, so the j index is a constraint. Right, this is for j equals 1 to m. Right? Uh, so we have m constraints. Uh, each one of them has coefficients uh, a, uh, a1j through anj uh, and the right hand side bj. Okay? Uh, and this equal sign, it could equally well be a greater than or equal to or a less than or equal to. It doesn't make a difference. It makes a big difference in the answer, but it doesn't make a difference to whether it's a linear program. Uh, so, for example, uh, we might want to um, maximize uh, so I'll, uh, maximize two uh, x plus three y um, subject to uh, x plus y is less than or equal to four. Two uh, x plus five y is less than or equal to twelve. Uh, x plus 2y is uh, less than or equal to 5, uh, and x and y are both bigger than or equal to 0. Right? So here I've called the variables x and y instead of x1 and x2, but hopefully that shouldn't cause any confusion. All right. And this is called the inequality form uh, of a linear program, where all constraints are inequalities. Uh, and all variables are unbounded, uh, except, of course, they could be bounded by an inequality here. right? I wrote an inequality to bound x and y above 0, but uh, I've specified no lower and upper bounds for x. Each one of the uh, x and y are just real numbers. OK? So uh, any, any questions about the form of a linear program? So why are we interested in linear programs? Um, we're interested in linear programs because they're very flexible, so having constraints uh, available can make it much easier to express problems of interest. Uh, and because it turns out that there are cool algorithms for solving them, uh, which we'll go into in the next couple of lectures. Okay? So linear programs are great. Uh, hopefully, you will learn to love them over the next few lectures. Um, and if not, well, maybe you'll learn to love them in the lectures after that. Um, all right, so one of the first things that we can do with a linear program uh, is to sketch it, right? And that's often important in figuring out sort of um, 
you know, by hand, if you have a small linear program, you can often solve it by hand. So um, let's take, here's the same linear program I wrote down on the last slide, uh, and I'll just uh, sketch it, right? So we'll draw a couple of coordinate axes, and we know that uh, x and y are both positive, right? So this is, um, uh, this is x is increasing this way, and y is increasing that way, right? So this is the constraint y bigger than 0, and this is the constraint x is bigger than 0. Um, let's put some, uh, some uh, tick marks on our axes, right? So something like this, uh, ta, 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 like that. Um, and uh, so this first constraint, x plus y is less than or equal to 4. Well, if uh, x is 0, then y can be as large as 4. If uh, y is 0, x can be as large as 4. And so we can just draw a nice straight line connecting those. And then we know that the answer is on that side of that line. Right? And the same thing, um, we do the same thing for all of these constraints. Right? We can find an intercept by setting one of the variables to 0, and then just draw the line through those intercepts. Right? So if we set, uh, in this constraint, if we set uh, x to 0, then y is 12 over 5, right? which is 2.2. Is that right? No, 2.4. Uh, right, so here's 2.4. Right, and we, if we set y to 0, then x can be as large as uh, 6. Yes? And so uh, I'll just draw it out like this, and it goes out to somewhere over here. Um, x plus 2y, right, so if x is 0, y is less than 5 halves, so just a little bit above here. Uh, and if y is 0, x is less than 5, right? So this is going to wind up being zoop, something like that. Uh, and then we already drew x and y bigger than 0, right? And so the feasible region is this part here, OK? So everybody think they could sketch an LP if we happen to ask you to do that on a homework or a test? Happen to. <laughs> All right. So. Um, Let's just make sure this is MATLAB will sketch it for us very nicely. Uh, and it looks like I got it pretty much right. Oh, the one thing I forgot to do was to, um, so we'll go back onto the previous slide, right? 2x plus 3y. Uh, so I'll draw the objective function um, coming off of this point here. Uh, it's going to look something like that, right? And then here's the objective function here, right? So. Um, a little bit of uh, LP terminology. Uh, so feasible points are the ones that are uh, in here. Infeasible points are out here, unsurprisingly. Um, so if you satisfy all the constraints, you're feasible. If you don't satisfy any one, you're infeasible. Out of all of the feasible ones, the one that is farthest in the direction of the objective is the optimal one, right? So this one here. Um, so uh, points which are infeasible are neither optimal nor suboptimal. But if you're, um, if you're feasible, you could be suboptimal. Or you could be optimal. Right? Um, for each one of these constraints, uh, you could have, uh, well, for example, there are no constraints active here. Right? Whereas for this point, right, we have uh, one constraint is active. And another word for active is tight, meaning that the point lies on the equality as opposed to being strictly on one side of it. Okay? Uh, and then the opposite of active is inactive or loose, uh, the opposite of tight. Um, one thing that you'll notice here is that the feasible region is polyhedral, right? So it's the intersection of a bunch of half spaces. Uh, therefore, by definition, it's a polyhedron. Uh, that's, that's, one of the that's one of the ways to define polyhedra. Um, another thing that we can say is that, uh, well, there are vertices, places where two constraints intersect, single points, right? And there are edges, right? So um, this is a vertex. 
Uh, this here is an edge. Right? And in higher dimensions we could have faces or hyperfaces or what have you, right? Hyper hyperfaces. Um, so uh, another thing that's, that's worth pointing out is uh, since we're trying to move in some direction as far as possible, Right? Either if it's a maximization problem, we want to move as far as possible in the direction of the objective vector. If it's a minimization, we want to move as far as possible in the opposite direction. And so that means that there's always going to be a uh, vertex uh, where the, which achieves the optimal value. Right? If, if the optimal value is achieved at all, there's going to be a vertex that achieves it. Uh, there could be other points that achieve it as well. For example, if the objective is zero, then every feasible point is also an optimal point. Right? Or sort of halfway in between, uh, if the objective were pointing like this, orthogonal to one of the faces, then every point along the face would be optimal. But there would be optimal uh, vertices, right? Both of the vertices at the end of the face would be optimal. All right? So that makes, makes sense? OK. So uh, I mentioned before that the feasible region is polyhedral. Um, polyhedra, the, the two representations that we looked at for polyhedra before are uh, as the convex hull of some set of points or as the intersection of some set of half spaces. The second way makes it obvious that the feasible region has to be polyhedral. Uh, and in general, no matter which way you define it, uh, you can have vertices, edges, faces, right? So um, uh, in general, a D face is uh, the set of feasible points that make um, uh, n minus d independent half spaces tight, right? So independent half spaces are the ones whose uh, normal vectors are linearly independent, which just means that they aren't parallel to one another. Uh, and if you make n minus d independent half space uh, constraints tight, well, the overall dimensionality of the space is n, and if you satisfy n minus d constraints, then it's going to be a d-dimensional set. Right, so a zero, uh, a zero face will be a zero-dimensional set. So that's what we more commonly know as a vertex. Right? Right, a one face will be an edge. Right, so this is a one face. Right, a two face is what we ordinarily think of a of a face in three dimensions, um, and in general, uh, a face that's of the highest possible dimension is going to be uh, called a facet in uh, in a linear program. So, um, if we have n variables and uh, m greater than or equal to n half spaces, right, you can have uh, uh, zero faces through n faces, right? The uh, zero face is the intersection of enough constraints to make a point, and the uh, n face is the full dimensionality, right? It's the highest dimension that you can possibly have, and the uh, there's only one n face, which is the entire uh, feasible region, right? Uh, and then the uh, n minus one face is called a facet. That's what I said before. All right. So uh, it's going to be convenient to use matrix notation to talk about these things. So um, we'll write uh, some vector of variables v, right? So in this case, v is equal to uh, x, y, right? In this example right here. Um, and a constant matrix A and a constant vector B. Uh, and we'll write A, V is less than or equal to B. Yeah. On the previous slide, yeah. Right. Right. No, no. An n face is an n dimensional face, right? So each of the edges ah. is a two face. Ah. We can have any number. Of two faces. That's a that's that's a very good point. So the the uh, that was uh, I should have been clearer 
I'm not saying anything here about how many faces, right? I'm talking about each object is called an n face if it's an n dimensional object. Okay? All right, so we have uh, AV is less than or equal to B, so that's interpreted to mean component wise, right? So A times V is a, vec is a vector, B is a vector, and so if each component of A times V is less than the corresponding component of B, then we say that that equality is satisfied. Uh, and the objective, I already uh, mentioned we could write it as a dot product between our vector of variables and a constant vector, right? And so what we, um, we can do is we can write uh, the uh, linear program as uh, max C transpose V subject to the constraint that uh, AV is less than or equal to B. Right? So that's a compact way to write the linear program. Uh, and in this particular case, I can write out the matrix. Right? So uh, for example, uh, this first constraint, right? Uh, if I want to write it as uh, A times our vector of variables, well, our vector of variables is x, y. So the coefficients of the first constraint are 1 and 1. Right? The second constraint, it's 2 and 5. The third constraint, it's 1 and 2. And then I have two more constraints here whose, um, uh, so they're the opposite sign, right? So it's going to be minus 1, 0, and 0, minus 1, right? So that's our matrix A. And our vector B is the vector of right hand sides 4, 12, 5, 0, 0, like that. And then C, this is 2x plus 3, 3y, so it's just 2, 3, right? So I can, take a, um, I can take this linear program and I can write it in matrix form, and it's a lot more compact to write down and I can manipulate it a lot more easily. Okay? All right, so now um, suppose that we want to find the optimum of our linear program, right? So uh, this is not really a serious algorithm, but here's a nice, uh, a nice algorithm. We take the feasible region and we rotate it so that the objective vector is pointing down. Right? Then we take a, um, then we take our, uh, our, uh, oops, we take our uh, ball here. Right, here's my ball, and we drop it and let it roll. Right, and it gets stuck here at the optimal point. Okay, so that's the uh, that's the algorithm for optimizing a linear program. Uh, it works in up to three dimensions. <laughs> Uh, again, notice that this makes it obvious that, the op that there is always an optimum at a corner, right? It could be that there's a single edge that's horizontal, but your ball, ball can roll back and forth to a corner along that edge, all right? Um, but there may be others. All right. Uh, so this algorithm doesn't always work, right? So, well, it works, but something weird can happen, right? So if the objective is to go down as much as possible, right, your ball will go... Whoa, woo, and off into the hallway, right? Um, so this is the where's my ball example. Uh, so um, we can also have uh, something like this, where we have a constraint that says x is bigger than 5, x is also less than 1, right? This is the very unhappy ball example. Uh, those of you who watched the original Star Wars will remember this scene. Yeah. Oh, well. <laughs> Nobody watched the original Star Wars? Come on. All right. Um, Luke, trash compactor. OK. Um, so uh, to, to uh, define what the optimum actually is in, uh, um, in the case of an empty feasible region, we're going to say that the minimum over an empty set is positive infinity, and the maximum over an empty set is minus infinity, right? Which uh, people take that convention because uh, adding an element to a set uh, will always uh, increase the minimum, right? Uh, sorry, decrease the minimum. Right? Uh, it, it could leave it the same, but it could be lower than anything else in the set, and so it will keep going down. Uh, and it will also always uh, increase the maximum. Okay? So uh, in this example here, 
uh, where, the, where it's a maximization problem with an empty feasible region, we'll say the value is minus infinity. And if it were a minimization problem, we'd say the value is plus infinity. Okay. All right. So um, a variation of uh, uh, a variation of linear programs are linear feasibility problems, where we just don't have an objective. Our objective is to find an x and y which satisfy a set of constraints, right? Um, and so this is like a linear program where we set the objective to zero. And you might think that this would be um, easier than a linear program, right? Because you're, you don't have to uh, find the optimal point. You just have to find any point. It turns out that the answer is no. It's actually not any, uh, any easier than a linear program. Uh, and one way to see it is suppose that we added a constraint right uh, here, right? Which said that the objective were bigger than some point, right? So uh, this is this here is uh, 2x plus 3y is bigger than or equal to, let's say, 8, right? The optimal value was 9. Uh, so you can see that you have to get quite close to the optimal point in order to satisfy this feasibility problem. And in general, uh, you could do binary search, right? So you could start by taking a constraint that's um, uh, orthogonal to the objective vector, right? Try and solve that. That's feasible. So you, you, know, you go up here, you try and solve this one, right, with the constraint going that way, and it says, no, it's not feasible, so you just start doing binary search, right? You add this constraint, and then that one, and then that one, right? And you narrow yourself down on the, uh, on the optimal point pretty quickly. Right. So it means that um, it takes only a log factor more time using this approach. And it turns out that we can, actually, um, we can actually do it with just a single feasibility problem instead of, uh, uh, instead of a sequence of feasibility problems if we want to. And uh, that is, um, uh, in order to do that, we actually have to cover a few more concepts first. But uh, uh, ask us later in the course, and we'll, we'll, give, that, uh, we'll give that reduction. All right. So um, if you have a linear program, uh, one of the things that we're going to spend a lot of time talking about is how to take this linear program and transform it into another linear program that might or might not be easier to solve. Uh, and so the algorithm, of course, for trying to solve it is you transform it, see if it's any easier. No, transform it again, see if it's any easier. Right. And eventually, hopefully, you get to a point where you find one that you can solve. Okay? I've seen a lot of papers that sort of came out of research like that. Somebody discovered a transformation of some class of linear programs that actually makes it easier to solve. Could make it harder to solve, but if so, you just throw away that piece of scratch paper and start again. Okay? So um, start out with some simple transformations. Um, we can easily get rid of all inequalities except for the variable bounds, which don't really count as the inequalities. Um, by using what's called a slack. Uh, so if we had uh, x plus y plus s is less than or equal to 4, where s is in uh, 0 comma infinity, right? So here, if this is satisfied for some value of s, then this original inequality is going to be satisfied. Because you just drop s, and you know x plus y has to be less than 4. Uh, yes, I did in fact mean equals. I didn't. Uh, this would be equivalent as well, but it would be not as nearly as useful because you wouldn't have gotten rid of the inequality. Uh, similarly, you could get rid of equalities if you want to and make only inequalities, right? So uh, one way to do this is to say x plus two y is less than or equal to four, and x plus two y is also bigger than or equal to four, right? So you can take two matched. Uh, two matched inequalities and make an equality out of them. Um, this turns out to give conniptions to some solving algorithms, so it's not necessarily always the right thing to do if you have to make two matched inequality constraints. But at least from the point of view of uh, equivalence of the problems, you can do this. All right, you can also get rid of free variables, right? So free variables are uh, something like x in r or y in r, right? So to get rid of x, uh, we can say that uh, x is equal to uh, a minus b, 
for a greater or equal to zero and b greater than or equal to zero, right? And so now if we represent each free variable as a difference between two positive or non-negative variables, then we can get rid of all of the free variables if we want to. We can also get rid of uh, bounded variables pretty easily, right? This, is, this one's almost trivial. If we have x is in R and 2 less than x less than 5, right, we can handle the bounds as inequality constraints if we want to instead of as bounds. Okay? All right, so... With these transformations that I've just talked about, we can take an, a linear program and make it into what's called a standard form linear program. So standard form means that all variables are non-negative, uh, right? All variables are constrained to be in zero to plus infinity. All constraints are equalities, so we've eliminated all of the inequality constraints. Uh, and that's it. Um, so, uh, for example, if we take this linear program and want to put it in standard form, um, well, we want to put it, so standard form is max C transpose Q subject to AQ equals B, and Q is bigger than or equal to zero, right? Q is our vector of variables here. So here we're going to take Q to be X, Y, and then uh, three new uh, slack variables, U, V, and W. And so uh, we're going to make a constraint. Uh, for example, this constraint is going to turn into X plus Y plus u is equal to 4, right? And so we can make um, uh, our matrix A uh, be, well, the first row will be 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, right? So that's x plus y plus u, and we're going to have a vector B here, which is uh, the right-hand side here, which is 4, right? Um, and then here, right, uh, we have 2x plus 5y, 2, 5, and then we have to use a separate slack variable for this constraint. Right? It doesn't make sense to use the same slack variable for two constraints. So this will be 0, 1, 0, and then this one here, x plus 2y, 1, 2, 0, 0, 1. Right? And the right-hand sides are 12 and 5. Right? And then these ones are already uh, included in the q bigger than or equal to 0 constraint. Okay. So we can take uh, any, uh, any uh, linear program and put it in this form. Oh, I should say also we have a, a cost vector, uh, right, which is uh, 2x plus 3y, and the slacks never appear in the objective, right? Uh, I'll write it transposed so that it's a column vector. Uh, but this representation here, right, where we take sort of a big... Uh, matrix, right, and we put the constraint matrix next to the right-hand side vector and the cost vector under it, that's called a tableau, right? And a tableau is a very compact way to write down a, uh, uh, a linear program. Okay? Uh, so, I Right, you could introduce a slack variable. You introduce a slack variable for every inequality constraint. For every variable, Difference of two, right? Like right, exactly. You could, you could. But it's it's a it's a polynomial factor. As a matter of fact, it's a linear factor, but it, it's um, it's uh, it does definitely increase the size. But the nice thing is that, um, for example, the slack variables. This is a very sparse portion of the matrix, and so you can handle it efficiently. Okay. Uh, all right. So um, one other useful uh, one other useful trick is to um, actually keep the objective in the tableau itself, right? So rather than having a uh, a separate row for the cost vector, you can just add an extra variable z and constrain z to be equal to the objective, right? And then. Uh, Right, so I guess I can write a line here to separate that. But this is called the objective row of the tableau. Right, this is the right-hand side column of the tableau, uh, and now this is—it's uh, just convenient to be able to manipulate the objective along with the other stuff as one matrix. Okay. And uh, one thing to point out is that this portion here, right the portion of the tableau that corresponds to the slacks and the objective, uh, 
that's always a um, always an identity matrix, right? So uh, each one of those variables appears in exactly one constraint, and so you can, uh, since they're equality constraints, you can make its coefficient be one in that constraint. Another thing to point out is that uh, there is no constraint on the range of z. Right. So this row is a, uh, this column, this variable is a special variable because it doesn't have any upper or lower bound. Mm -hmm. So let's take a look then at. Um, uh, so I, I've talked now about two different forms, right? One is inequality form, where every variable is free, no upper or lower bounds, and every constraint is an inequality. Uh, and I've also talked about the uh, standard form, where every variable is non-negative and every constraint is an equality. Okay? And so you can write the same program two different ways. Uh, and if we just do a little bit of counting, so suppose that the standard form has n variables and m equations, right? And so we know that uh, m has to be less than or equal to n, or we can take it to be that way, right? Because uh, there's no way to have uh, more than n independent uh, in, uh, equality constraints. Then the inequality form, uh, well, m of those variables are going to be slacks, right? And so there'll be n minus m variables in the inequality form. Um, and then uh, each one of these um, uh, each one of these slack variables has to be constrained to be bigger than or equal to zero, right? So that's going to add uh, n minus m constraints to the inequality form. Uh, and then we still have the m original constraints, which are now inequalities because we added a uh, uh, because we um, took out the slack variable, right? And so we have uh, n total uh, inequalities in the original, uh, in the standard form, right? And so in this example, uh, m is 3, right? There's, uh, this is m equals 3 constraints, and n is 5, uh, x, y, and uh, u, v, w, right? So this here is n equals 5, right? That's the list of all of our variables. And so if we look here, we have 5 constraints, right? This one is 2 here, uh, and uh, we have two variables, which is uh, 5 minus 3 is 2, right? Okay. So um, there will be fewer variables in the inequality form. Is that a question? No. no. Okay. Uh, there will be fewer variables in the inequality form. And so typically, if we sketch a linear program, we'll sketch it in the inequality form. Right, because um, well, here, right, the inequality form—it's two dimensions. I can sketch it nicely on a slide. I don't have a five-dimensional slide projector, and so I can't sketch the uh, the equality form very well, the standard form. Um, let's see. So, in the uh, in the inequality form, the corners are the intersections of two constraints. Right, so here. Right? Or um, uh, if, we have two, if we have more than two variables, if we have d variables, there'll be um, uh, an intersection of d constraints. Uh, and uh, if you look at it in the standard form, uh, well, two constraints satisfied exactly, two constraints tight, means that two of the slack variables are 0. Right? And so uh, a corner in standard form corresponds to a place where we've set enough of the slack variables to 0 to completely determine the remaining other variables. Right? So if we take a look then at, uh, if we take a look then at um, faces, right? So um, in inequality form, just to remind you, we had n variables and m greater than or equal to n half spaces. And we could have zero, zero faces through n faces, right? The zero face is a vertex. The n face is the whole feasible region. And the d face makes n minus d inequalities tight, right? By contrast, in standard form, so we have, again, n variables, but they're all constrained to be non-negative. And now m has to be less than or equal to m. Right is the number of constraints, 
Uh, and so we can still have um, uh, we can have uh, zero faces up through um, n minus m faces, right? So. Um, So what's going to wind up happening is that uh, well, I guess the easiest way to see this is to uh, use the transformation on the previous slide to put it back into inequality form, right? And this is the number of variables in the inequality form, which is the bound on the number of faces, right? All right. So um, why is standard form useful? Right? Um, standard form is the way that people usually write linear programs when they actually want to solve them. Uh, and the reason for that is that because they're equality constraints, we can do things like Gaussian elimination. Right? We can take linear combinations of constraints and make other constraints out of them. Uh, for example, if I take um, this constraint here and subtract this constraint here, right? So uh, so uh, let's write that as that minus that, right? We get um, 2x minus x is x, 3y minus 2y is y, uh, and that's equal to 5 minus 4 is 1, right? So I can do, um, I can do these uh, row operations, right? Just taking linear combinations of constraints, and I'm free to take any row operation. Right? I can negate an equality constraint, and it's still true, but that's not true of an inequality. Right? If I negate an inequality constraint, it changes it. And so what that's going to mean is that it's going to be easy to find corners of the, um, of the feasible region using Gaussian elimination. Right? Gaussian elimination is the uh, reason for existence of row ops, basically. And so we can, uh, um, we can find corners using Gaussian elimination. So... Um, Really simple example, right? So let's, these are x, y, u, v, and w, and the right hand side here, right? Uh, and so if we set x and y to zero, right, then we have a square matrix here for u, v, and w, and we can figure out uh, what the values of u, v, and w are. Yeah? So corners are zero faces. Uh, yes, uh, because oh, because we can use the positivity constraints, right? Yeah, uh, we have right five more in addition to these three constraints, right? So we can we can definitely get no no. It's three plus five is eight, right? Okay, but yes, we uh, we can always take. I mean. Standard form and inequality form are equivalent, and so if we can get corners in the inequality form, we can get them in the standard form. Okay. Yeah. The. Oh. Uh, Right, so the, uh, because there are extra variables in the standard form, right, to represent all of the slacks, and because we're taking a bunch of equality constraints to reduce the dimensionality of the space, the feasible region has lower dimensionality than the ambient space in, when we're writing it in standard form. Does that answer your question? So you can have, you can have any... Um, I mean, if you have here, we have five variables with three constraints, and so it's a two-dimensional feasible region, right? But in general, we could have, you know, 100 variables and 30 constraints get 70-dimensional feasible region, right? And then when we put it in inequality form, we get rid of the slack variables, and so at least potentially the, um, the feasible region is full-dimensional. Yeah. Yes, right. In this example, it's a 2D 
right? It's, it's the number of variables minus the number of constraints, assuming linear independence between the constraints. Okay. Okay, so um, here uh, we can find a corner um, by setting any two variables to zero, right? So here I'm setting x and y to zero, and I can actually just read off u, v, and w, right? So I have x and y are zero, and then u is four from this constraint, right? Uh, v is 12, w is five, right? So that one was really easy, right? Because we crossed out everything but an identity matrix. We didn't have to do any work there. Um, we could uh, instead set uh, v and w to zero, right? And then we just have a square system of linear equations, which we can solve uh, to figure out what uh, x, y, and u are. Um, and I happen to have done that ahead of class so that I don't have to do it in front of everybody. Um, and we have x, y, and u are uh, 1, 2, and 1, uh, assuming I didn't make any mistakes, right? Um, and so uh, we, can, um, we can take a look at... Um, Right, so here x and y were zero. So if we go to our feasible region, right, it's this corner right here. Make sense? Uh, here x and y were one and two. So if we go to our sketch here, x one, y two, we got this corner here, right? This is, and this one is zero zero, right? Okay. So let's do it one more time. Uh, let's set uh, x to zero and u to zero, right? Uh, and uh, so here, um, if we solve, we get uh, y is equal to 4, uh, v is equal to minus 8. Whoops, that's not an 8. <laughs> I've been doing too much math uh, when, there we go, minus 8. And uh, z is, e uh, sorry, z, um, that's a w, is equal to minus 3, right? So um, you can tell there's some problem here because v and w are supposed to be non-negative, right? So if we go and try and plot it, right, x is 0, y is 4, right, that's up here somewhere. It's the intersection of these constraints, right? This is 0, 4. And so you can see that we are at the intersection of a couple of constraints, but we violated a whole bunch of the other constraints. So it's a corner in some sense, but it's not one of the corners we wanted. Right? And so, um, well, that, that basically just uh, um, gets to the moral of the story, which is uh, the way you find a corner, corner, you cross out a couple of columns, right? You cross out enough columns so that you get a square matrix remaining. But you don't just blindly solve that system of equations. You solve it, and then you check the answer. And there are two things you have to check. One is you might be left with a system of equations that's not um, full rank, in which case you might not be able to solve it. Uh, and two is the solution might have some negative components, in which case it's a corner, it's an intersection of multiple constraints, but it's outside the feasible region. Okay? So uh, I think it might be a good time now to uh, take a brief break, uh, and we'll come back in a few minutes. All right, so uh, let's get back started again. So um, I mentioned before that one of the nice things about, um, uh, about uh, standard form is that you can do these row operations, right? Uh, and so in particular, you can take uh, any row of your uh, linear program, and you can replace that row with a linear combination of the existing rows. Right? as long as you don't lose linear uh, independence between the constraints. Right? So for example, um, I can take uh, um, this first row here in my, uh, in my constraint matrix and use it to eliminate the variable x from the remaining two rows. Right? So um, if I take twice this constraint and subtract it from that constraint, right, I will get uh, you know, 2 minus 2 is 0. Uh, 5 minus 2 is 3, uh, 0 minus 2 is uh, minus 2, right? And then 
uh, 1, 0, right? Uh, 12 minus 8 uh, is 4, right? And so after I put this one in, I can just throw this one out, right? Because these are now still three linearly independent equality constraints. And uh, so this is, this is nice, right? It lets me transform my, uh, my linear program in an interesting way. I can do the same thing here, right? I can use, uh, I can eliminate x from this row here by subtracting 1 times this constraint from this one, right? And I'll get uh, 1 minus 1 is 0, 2 minus 1 is 1, 0 minus 1 minus 1, uh, 0 minus 0 is 0, uh, 1 here, and 5 minus 4 is 1, right? Uh, and then I can cross that one out. And now I have three constraints left. Uh, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, right? 0, 3, minus 2, 1, 0, and this one here, right? And now I have um, an interesting thing about this is that now the variable x appears in only one constraint, right? And so that you could imagine that that might be, uh, that that might be useful to do in solving a linear program. Yeah? Uh, right, I'll get to that in a couple of slides. That's, uh, that's, a, that's a very good point. Uh, and right now, I mean, the objective is still the same, right? Uh, we just have a different set of constraints. But we might want to transform the objective as well. For example, we might want to eliminate x from the objective. Okay. All right, so um, here's the, what I wrote on the last slide, right? This is the, the remaining constraints. And it's kind of interesting to take a look at this, right? It used to be that we were thinking of u, v, and w as the slacks in our constraints, right? And we said before that the slacks, uh, the way you could tell what the slacks were, were, well, they corresponded to an identity matrix that was a submatrix of the constraint matrix, right? And so now, um, uh, if you define slacks to be variables that appear in just one constraint, then the slacks are now uh, x, v and w, right, instead of u, v and w. So I transformed it, and I also changed the way in which we might want to interpret it, right? And they are, uh, so I'll just write that here, uh, vars uh, appearing in exactly one constraint. Okay? Uh, and so if we uh, eliminated x from all but one constraint, all of a sudden, uh, x became a slack, if we take that interpretation. Uh, and then if you take a look at the constraint that we used to eliminate x, remember we used this first row to eliminate x, u started out as a slack variable, but we got some fill-in, some uh, non-zero coefficients in the other two constraints. And so um, that variable gets kind of messed up, right? So, uh, uh, whoops. So uh, it's slack which is u in this case, uh, is no longer a slack. Right? When, we, uh, when, we do this, uh, um, when we do this transformation. And so that's, that's interesting, right? We have two uh, completely equivalent standard forms in the sense that they both represent their simple transformations of the same optimization problem. But uh, the way that we want to interpret it is, is different, right? So um, for example, if we uh, try and sketch this linear program, well, here we want to make y and u be the variables that we're actually looking at. And x, v, and w, we interpret them as slacks. right? And so um, we get something that looks like this. right? So here's the new thing. And this here is um, the, uh, this is the y-axis. And this is the u-axis. right? And so uh, here's the tableau that I gave before. Uh, and here's what it looks like when we consider x, v, and w as slacks, right? So here, right, this is y plus u plus a slack is equal to 4, so y plus u is less than or equal to 4, right? And so on for the other constraints. And you can see the feasible region looks really different than it did before, right? And so um, we've achieved our goal, uh, at least one, one way of achieving our goal, right? We've, we've changed the linear program in such a way that uh, it looks really different even though it's equivalent. And so this one might be easier to solve than the, the previous one. Turns out it isn't, but we'll, we'll get back to that. 
OK. So uh, you mentioned the objective, right? So here I have a constraint saying that the variable z is equal to 2x plus 3y, right? Uh, and it makes sense to try and eliminate x from the objective, right? Because if we want to interpret x as a slack variable, we're not allowed to have the slack variables mentioned in the objective. And so what we're going to do uh, is uh, use this same constraint here to eliminate x from the objective. So we'll add twice this constraint to the objective row, right? And so it becomes uh, uh, minus 2 plus 2 is 0, minus 3 plus 2 is minus 1, um, 0 plus 2 is 2, uh, 0, 0, 1. And then uh, here you can think of this as being a 0, right? There was no constant offset to the objective. And so what we're doing is adding 8, right, uh, to this. Right, so there's now a constant offset of 8 to the objective. And that constant offset, it, we can ignore it, right? Because optimizing z plus 8 is the same as optimizing z. Uh, but we can keep track of it if we want to figure out what the transformation is between the actual optimal value of one program and the other. Right? And so now we're going to cross out this row. Right? We no longer need it. And our objective is um, to maximize. Uh, z, which is equal to uh, y minus 2u, right? Uh, and we can use the, we can have the 8 or not, right? Um, so plus 8 if we want to. Okay? And again, remember that z is an unconstrained variable, which is why we have this horizontal rule here. Right, so uh, um, z is still the special variable that is not uh, cons doesn't have a lower bound on it. Okay, so that's how we handle the objective in a uh, when we're doing when we're eliminating x from all of the uh, from all of the constraints. Right, we just eliminate x from the objective in the same way that we eliminated it from every other constraint. All right, so. Um, I mentioned that uh, we always, when we sketch standard form, we usually just turn it into inequality form to sketch it because it has fewer variables. Uh, and so this means that there are actually multiple ways to sketch the same linear program, right? You can take any subset of variables and turn them into slacks uh, and then sketch it with those variables as slacks. And you'll get different looking feasible regions, right? And here are the two examples. This was using x and y as the uh, as the real non-slack variables, right? And this was using y and u as the real non-slack variables. Um, so uh, in general, right, in this case, we're going to be able to choose any three of the five variables to be slacks. So there'll be five choose three uh, possible ways to, uh, to sketch this. OK? Yes? Um, they don't have to be similar. Uh, I think they're just similar in the, so they're going to have the same number of constraints in them, right? And uh, they're going to have the same number of uh, uh, variables in them, right? And so there's going to be a positivity constraint on each of them, right? So I think what we're, what we're seeing here is just that in two dimensions, there aren't really many five-sided polygons where two of the sides are the coordinate axes. Um, but and so we happen to get one that looks kind of similar. In general, I don't think it, it winds up having to look at all at all similar. Yeah. No, it doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to have a similar volume. Um, it's uh, um, here. I picked an example which uh, everything's small integers. The matrices are well conditioned, so the transformations don't change the volume very much. But you could definitely change the volume as well. Yeah. Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, so uh, there is um, so there's a sense in which it's the same, right? So you can always get um, uh, there. So there's the same number of constraints, and so you can always select 
uh, right? So there's five constraints here, and so there's always five choose two corners, but not all of them are feasible. Um, I think it's going to be the case that the same number will be feasible, but I don't have a geometric intuition for that. Is it a one-to-one -one transformation? Uh, yeah, you're right. It is a one-to-one. -one. It's an invertible transform between them. And so, so it does have to be. Uh, well, but then, then you would say that the feasible region has to be the same shape, no, right? Like an affine transform of the same shape. It has to, it has to preserve the number of so the mapping between the, you know, the database of one and some other. Yeah. Let me, let me think about this offline. Uh, I think this is an interesting, an interesting question, and I don't, have, I don't have enough geometric intuition to answer it well right now. I saw another hand up here somewhere. OK. That's, 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 that's a very good question. All right. So, yeah. What I'm, what I'm worried about is um, introducing degeneracies, essentially, in one that are not present in another. Right? So, um, but if the transformation is invertible, that shouldn't happen. But again, let me think about it. Let me let me think about it not in front of everybody, so I don't say something too dumb. Uh, yeah. What's that? So. Um, let's see. So I guess. Okay, so, so, so let's think about it here, right? So we have some point here, right? And this point specifies values for all of the variables, right? Um, it specifies the values for y and u natively, and it specifies the values for all of the other variables, um, for all of the other variables by how far you are from satisfying the constraints with equality, right? So, uh, um, So that means then that that particular vector of five numbers you can also plot here, right? Um, just by plotting the xy component instead of the yu components, and so there is a one-to-one -one transformation between points. And so that means that that it's not a coincidence that everything looks similar, uh, and that there's going to be an invertible transformation. But the conditioning of that transformation could be pretty bad, right? An invertible linear transformation. Yeah. Right, so, so um, each one of these lines here is going to be a coordinate axis in one of the five, uh, like it's going to be a, you know, a coordinate axis. It's normal will be a coordinate axis in the, in the five-dimensional version, right? And so these are all projections of the same five-dimensional shape onto two, uh, onto two variables. So, yeah, okay. So, so you made me you made me think of the answer in front of everybody. I hope it's not wrong. All right. But yeah, that's a good way of thinking of it, right? Is that there's some something happening in five dimensions with all all five of these variables, the original variables and the slacks, and what we're seeing are different two dimensional projections of the shape, which can look quite different. Okay. All right. So. Um, what if there aren't any slacks, right? So if we have something in standard form uh, where there are no variables that appear in any, one con in any one constraint, in only one constraint. Well, we can use row operations to make slacks, right? So here, for example, um, we can eliminate u from the second constraint, right, by subtracting three times the first, right? And so this becomes uh, 0 uh, minus 5v, minus 4w is equal to 5 minus 9 minus 4, right? Did I get that right? Um, and so now uh, u appears in only one constraint with a coefficient of 1, and so now we can in, uh, interpret it as a slack variable, right? Um, and then the same way we could take 
uh, let's say, v here and eliminate it from the first constraint and divide through by minus 5 so that it has a coefficient of 1, right? And then, it w then we would have another slack variable, right? So uh, if we don't have slack variables, we just make some, right? And it turns out that's pretty easy to do in MATLAB. So here's uh, an example of a 2 by 3 constraint matrix A, right? So this is A times our variables is equal to B. Uh, and if we pick any two columns of A, let's say the first two columns, and multiply the whole constraint matrix by the inverse of that submatrix, right, we'll get the identity matrix in those columns that we picked and something else in the other columns. Right? And we can do the same thing with the objective vector, and we get a, uh, a linear program with an identity submatrix in the constraint matrix. Right? So that's not necessarily the most efficient way to do it, but you can always pick any, uh, any subset of variables, and as long as that's a full rank square submatrix, you can make them into the slack variables. Okay? Uh, and then the same thing you can do uh, with an objective ve vector. You just have to remember uh, that you always pick Z's column, right? You don't ever want to lose having the fact that you can express the objective directly as a linear combination of the other variables. And so here, right, this is um, the constraint matrix A and B. And if we take um, any four linearly independent columns, so in this case, uh, one, four, five, and six, right, then we can invert that submatrix multiply it by A and B, and get this, right? And again, Z is always part of our set of variables that we pick, and we've turned uh, X, V, and W into slacks, right? And this is exactly what we worked out before, but now we're making MATLAB do it for us, which is always a good idea. So uh, these sets of variables, sets of... Uh, uh, a square submatrix of your objective uh, of your constraint matrix that has linearly independent columns, right? If you have something like that, uh, the sets of variables are called bases, uh, and the elements of a basis are uh, well the basic variables. There are always m of them if there are m equality constraints, uh, and. What we just saw is that it's easy to write the values of the basic variables in terms of the non-basic ones, right? So if we've chosen our uh, basis here, right, this is our basis, so we can set x and y to 0 and then just read off the values of u, v, w, and z, right? u is 4, v is 12, w is 5, z is 0, right? Or we can uh, make our basis be this, right? So that's our basis here. And if we set y and u to 0, then in this form, it's easy to read off the values of x, 4, v, 4, w, 1, and z, 8. Right? So, um, so that's nice. So uh, bases are going to turn out to be pretty important. Uh, so let's, let's spend a little bit of time uh, trying to interpret them. Um, so if we take a look at the, uh, the previous slide, right? So uh, we set x and y to, um, uh, sorry, we set x and y to 0 here, right? And so uh, if we look here, right, that corresponds to a corner. Uh, and here we set y and u to 0. Um, so y is 0 and we read off x equals 4, right? And so that's... Uh, this point up here, right, that we, uh, that we looked at before. Uh, and uh, in general, every time we pick a basis, it's going to get us a, a corner, right? Uh, it, it might be a corner of the feasible region or it might be infeasible, but it's going to be the intersection of the appropriate number of constraints. And uh, so that just holds in general. Um, if we have standard form with n variables and m equations, uh, fix some particular inequality form that we're going to start drawing on, like I fixed this, like I fixed uh, this thing in the previous slide and plotted multiple corners on it. Did I write the wrong thing? Um, oh, that's right. It should be four zero instead of zero four. Right. Very good. So let's see. Uh, 
there. I can make it go away as if it was never there. And there's our, uh, thank you for pointing that out. So yes, it should be four, I, I plotted the wrong thing. It's four zero and not zero four. Uh, but in general, uh, if we have n variables, m equations, we pick an inequality form like the one that's in the previous slide, and uh, we pick a basis, right, for the standard form. Uh, so that means we pick m basic variables, n minus m non-basic. We set all of the non-basic ones to zero, read off the values of the basic ones. That gives us a value for every single one of our variables in the, uh, in the standard form. Um, then we can plot. Uh, pick the right two variables to plot, right? The right n minus m variables to plot on our uh, figure, and it's going to be a corner, right? So every non-basic variable is going to be set to zero, meaning it's going to uh, lead to a tight inequality. Uh, either it's a slack, in which case that there's a um, right that's like uh, this inequality here, right, where we set its slack to zero, so that inequality is tight. Or, um, uh, or it's going to be a variable that's explicit in the inequality form, right? So, uh, for example, here, uh, y is explicit, and we set it to 0, right? And so it's going to be a tight constraint, which is the constraint y bigger than or equal to 0. So we're always going to have um, uh, uh, every non-basic variable yielding a tight inequality. Um, and... So if we have in the inequality form, there's going to be n minus m variables and n minus m tight inequalities, we're going to get a corner, right? So uh, I think that's probably a good spot to stop, and we'll continue with linear programs next time around.